I know you watched the uh, the game at Marvel yesterday between the Saints and Port Adelaide, which wasn't great, but what did you make of it and the fallout from it? I found out the Horn Francis still doesn't have a left foot, uh, and I may have te- I may have texted you, you when he tried have. to kick one yeah. straight. He, he, he had a shot at goal. If it had a, if he had had a left foot, would have been a nice little easy one. And he went on the outside of his boot and missed it. Three minutes late, he, ta- he takes the game on, kicks one straight through. But Kane's reply was, "He's got a right foot though," and uh, he, he definitely did. It, look, it was it was not a pretty game. Uh, it was it was painful to watch. It's you sort of go through and and you're thinking at Marvel Stadium how. What, what, what could the scoring be if it was two quality, aggressive teams? And we know that Port Adelaide are an aggressive team, but it just got muddled down. It was defensive footy. Uh, and you go through and you sort of look and think, is that the best we can produce? Um, because I know I, multiple times I wanted to, to turn it off, but to, to have a game of 60 to 62 in perfect conditions, you sort of sit back and scratch your head and go, it's not really the trend that's been winning finals of late. If you look at the teams that have been winning finals, Geelong in 2022, they changed from being a boring slow defensive team uh, and then they jumped over to you look at what Sydney have been able to do, you look at what Collingwood have been able to do, it's about aggression Kane, taking the mm. game on being exciting, mm. that's what's winning finals and that's what's getting you at the top of the ladder that's not what we saw yesterday nope. Hodgie uh, and Kane, how does somebody of the talent of Corn Francis get through without a left foot? <laughs> I mean, clearly he's dominant and he would have been a really strong kid but from a development perspective he's come through a you know, his, his, his uh, stepdad played footy. How does he not have a left foot? He did kick uh, one. I think he's he's okay on his left. It's not a strength of his okay. um, game, but I guess probably Hodgie, as a junior footballer, was able to burst away from stoppage yep. and yeah. have the power to want, run away from everyone, whereas at AFL level you are going to get caught out at stages. Yeah, that, that's 100% right. Because when if you've got blokes that are either bigger and stronger, they can throw kids around and do what they want, or you've got kids that have power and speed, they'll be able to burst from a stoppage. And then they've got that time to be able to straighten up on, onto the right and gain spot on. In AFL football, especially if you're all coming up teams, and teams today scout everyone. They know that Horn Francis doesn't like going onto his left. So if you, if you can push him enough when he's running around towards his left side, he's going to have to go into to his right foot. So uh, it would have been that. It just would have been the fact that he was that good as a kid that he wouldn't need to have used his left. But That's where coaching like, comes in, saying this kid's going to the top, he needs his left side. Yeah, well, I guess if the coaches at North Melbourne couldn't tell him, I'm tipping the under-18 coaches wouldn't be able to tell him. Mm. I should have introduced you in this way, Hodgie, the Hawthorne champion and the most popular special comments man as voted by the fans. Hello. Luke Hodge at 15% is the number one special comments man, according to the fans on AFL.com. 15 is a bit so, later. Sorry for that, Hodgie. You are the most <sighs> popular commentator. How do you feel about that? Well, Kane, I did put in the notes. That's what you should have put me down as. That was pretty disappointing. But I guess that's one bonus about having a lot of kids. They get to vote a lot for you. So, <laughs> what, so what about uh, the Saints and and the coach Ross Lyon? And you've got some thoughts on on that coaching move and moving on from Brett Ratton. Oh, I know it's it's tough for football clubs to try and if you look at a list and say we need to be better, and you look at the coach that's you've got there and the coach that's available, and they clearly thought that. Brett Ratton wasn't getting what they wanted out of, of the list. Uh, Ross comes in, and obviously Ross has coached four grand finals, I think, with the draw um, against Collingwood. So he's he's been there a number of times. But they knew what they were getting. And, and the comment that I just sort of said before was how the game has changed and what, what wins games of football is taking the game on. It's not so much, yes, defence helps, but that slow, composed ball movement, the old – it used to be a saying when – this is back in 2006 and seven. it was like attacking a manner to defend, defending a manner to attack. So you've got to build the ball up slow enough that if you turn the ball over, you can defend behind it. And I think Ross takes that to the nth degree mm. uh, because you go through and you look at the scores that they've been able to, to hit – uh, but even going from Ratton to, to Ross Lyon, the defence hasn't changed. They're still giving up 78 points a game, but it's offensively. They're giving up a, almost a goal more. They, sorry, they're a goal less uh, offensively under Ross. So you're sort of sitting here going, they knew what they were getting themselves in for, and this is exactly why. So you talk to supporters and they're like, we can defend, but we can't score. If you if you can't kick a winning score, especially at Marvel kicking sixty points, you're not going to win too many games. Mm, yeah, there's a, there is a sense of hopelessness a little bit with with the Saints. Like the eighteen thousand fans go there, their best and most talented young players have regressed at the rate of knots. I'm speaking about Owens. I wonder what happened to Mitch Owens. Like I look at him and 
G looks like a good player in a one-on-one -on -one contest, but he doesn't get to enough contests. He doesn't get enough of the ball. He'd be well, last year he was the, uh, I think, the highest-rated one-on-one yeah. player in the game. But now he's and touching he's, the footy nine times a yeah, game. He's not getting near, near it no, enough. Near it. In fact, I thought they should have put him deeper and put uh, Max King up the ground early in the piece because it just wasn't working the way it was. So you look at that, and, and Win Hager has now been forced to play the Ryan Crowley role where he's actually not even worried about the footy. And I know a lot of Saints fans were excited about the prospect of him being a genuine running wingman slash on ball and now he's getting 10 touches a game and trying to scrag and hold on Wilson seven touches yesterday not really critical there because he's had a good first year but Filippo playing VFL Max King Hodgie who I know you want to speak about and and I guess just the a bit of disgruntlement that you're hearing around the place and you spoke about Ron Marshall last week Sammy now that's been clarified by Tom Morris this morning but yeah it just doesn't seem a great place with a lot of hope at the moment no but you just mentioned then about the the King like if you've got a player who's 18th month still to run on the contract, and I can understand 100% when you've got a superstar coming through that you want to wrap them up as much as you can, but you also you, you sign those long contracts on a little bit of reward for what they've been able to give you. And, and yes, if you've got your injuries, you might you might be able to extend them that way, saying, well, he's been injury prone. Uh, let, let's give him a little bit of time to get his best. But the, the lack of competitive spirit that what we saw yesterday, Zerk Thatcher was all over him, Don't didn't bring the ball to ground. The fact is, is and it, we were sort of looking at Tom Hawkins for one, saying Haw, Hawk's a 35-year-old man who the game, it looked like the game had gone past him, but he'd still kicked 15 goals from his 12 games. King's kicked, what is it, 19 from his 12. So you're sitting here going, you're about to give another contract extension with a bloke who's already got 18 months on his deal, another six or seven years for kicking 19 goals from 12 games and getting beaten convincingly by a bloke who we've probably sat here yeah. saying, Zerk Thatcher's probably hasn't had a great season for Port Adelaide, but he he tore the strips off King mm. yesterday. It's even I'll worse, just, it's even worse Hodgie. He's contracted until the end of 2026. It, it is bizarre. Was it yeah. Zerk Thatcher's best game ever? Yeah, the best game I've seen him play. Yeah. I didn't think he had that in him. But where, where does that put for the rest of the guys? So 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 for the guys at St Kilda, and this is where it's all about even, and, and football's not even. You always look after your higher draft picks more than the guys that are just getting on the list. But if I'm a player at St Kilda and I'm busting my backside to give everything I possibly can, playing out of position, going back to the seconds if I have to, coming back in, learning a different role, but then I'm scratching for one-year contracts and I'm minimum and, and they won't give me a 20 grand pay raise. Or, but then you're looking at a contract like King who has not lived up to expectations. He's got 18 months on a contract and they want to extend him for another six, mm. seven years or whatever. This is where the, the, this, the disharmony in a football club can start to, to sink in when, when someone gets looked after like that. <laughs> it looks like they're looking what after him. What sort of number do you think they're talking about, Sammy? Like we're, we're talking an extension now. He would already be easily their highest paid. Oh, player. you'd be talking. We're talking millions. Eight, eight nine, eight, yeah. high nines. Yeah, it would be per year. Mm. But I'm just coming back to what Hodgie's saying. I think, I think it's fair to say, speaking to people who are connected to St Kilda, the level of job satisfaction's been higher at Moorabbin. That is for sure. So we, we did speak about Marshall publicly, certainly not on his own. There was some smoke around Jack Steele potentially being traded last year. Some other players you hear about not overly happy at the moment. And look, maybe the win loss necessitates you're never going to be thrilled with things but there's just it's going to be a fascinating off season I think coming up particularly player movement window at the Saints mm, all right and Ross Lyon catching up with Rowan Marshall and clearing things up during the week yeah. which was uh, interesting in itself not really that interesting but the, the fact that that happened off the week and the speculation is somewhat uh, relevant all right you want to speak about the Suns pretty good win at home Hodgie well that's all we've been saying <laughs> that they're that's that's the only place that they can win Kane if you look through it and I'm not sure if you're on last week or not but I threw out a few stats coming into the Collingwood game about the Suns at home compared to the Suns away. And we went through it and the Suns at home, disposal-wise, are rated number one in the AFL, 16th, 16th when they play away. Contested possessions, they're rated number one, 16th when they play away. Uncontested possessions, they're rated number one. 16th when they play. How, Kane, mm. if you played mm. a lot, living in a state, playing your whole your whole career in a state where you have to travel, how can it be so different from pulling on the boots, running out in front of your home crowd compared to playing in front of a, an away side when the ball's the same side? Yes, the, the ground's maybe a little bit slippery or, mm. or the, the, the size might be a little bit different. 
Is it routine? Is it professionalism? Is it mindset? How can you have such a big jump from playing at home compared to when you jump on a plane it's, and travel yeah, away? It's a million dollar question, isn't it? Some teams travel really well and, and the travel doesn't affect them. And, and most of those teams are Victorian teams who don't do it as often as what Gold Coast do. So I think it's a, a mix of everything that you've just said. And that's the frustrating part for the footy club is you chuck all these ingredients into the recipe, but you're not exactly sure which one it is. And it might be different things for different players, Jared. Oh, absolutely. I mean, right now, I saw them uh, the week before. They were poor. They were. They were really Frio, yeah. poor against Frio. And uh, then they were really competitive against the Pies. And the beauty, I think, of that victory in total, Hodgie, was they, they gave up the lead, but then they found a way to get back. And if they can just get that competitiveness, they are, given the uh, quality of the sides they've got away, there's still a chance to play finals this year. But oh, they are, but, and I think the guys that we spoke about last week—the difference between Anderson and Rowell and Took playing yeah. at home compared to away—it's it's a massive difference. And I know, Jared, you laughed at me last week when I said, "Well, Andrew Russell, Kane, you spent a lot of time with Andrew. Whenever we played away, he made sure there was no buffets because it's small <laughs> little things like this is you got to yeah. get used to the same food that you have at home. You you eat away. You get up and go for a walk in the morning mm. when you're playing in a state like you would. Same bed routines. You don't stuff around with the guys the night before a game like. You wouldn't do that at home. These It's small little things where people go, they're adults. Surely they can look after themselves. Unfortunately, they're comfortable. They, they go away, and most time, most of the times when you do go and live in a hotel, it is. They've got a chocolate bar in the fridge. You don't have that at the in the, in the room when you're at home. All these little things you don't normally think la- of when I you're at home, they at just you. slip I, in. I laughed at you, Hodgie, because you actually enunciated all the things I used to love about travelling <laughs> <laughs> when I was playing with the Swans, and we didn't have – that big an issue with away games for uh, whatever reason. We never actually – it wasn't part of the lingo. It wasn't part of the actual the narrative. You just played. But that, I think that's the thing is – and when I first came in to, to AFL, we used to pack your going out gear before you pack your footy gear. <laughs> yeah, that's right. – like things change and yeah. teams teams got professional. And I know that Port Adelaide, well, there's a reason why they finished on top of ladder in 2002, 2003, 2004 is because they were one of the first clubs to make that change yep. and do everything they possibly could – and – Hawthorne were a long way behind until Andrew Russell got to the football club and changed things. It's it, it does seem funny. It's like it's not that hard. Go away and play football. But it's all those little things from when you pack your bag to head to the airport to jumping on a plane. What are you eating? Are you eating on the plane before? All these little things do sound – people only really think about it is when you're traveling with kids. You mm. prepare before you get on the plane with mm. kids because you know that they're going to cry. They're going to mm. crack the shit. So they're going to do everything. So you've got to prepare for it. Yeah, have got to have the same mindset when you're traveling in a state because – you got to. You can't leave it to air the airline food or what's on at the hotel. You need to prepare yourself. I like Dimmer though. Hint to hint to coaches. Tag this Stakos oh, well, fella. They didn't know that. Uh, really? He's <laughs> pretty good. That, generally, that, speaking. they watch football in the last three years. Just a little not? hint, Kane. All right, just a little hint for you. Make sure you tag <laughs> it's, him. It's, it's, unbel- it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's extraordinary. Isn't it, really? He's speaking like, like he played three games. <laughs> but, he should have won the Brownlow last year. His favourite for it this year. He goes all right, Jared. Tell me why it's taken until round sixteen for <laughs> he need to be tagged. Mm. Well, this is true. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's bizarre. But it's it seems at the moment, now Hodgie will have a, a, a sharper eye on this than me, but it seems at the moment, though, you're either you've got a, a straight jacket on, there's someone really tagging you, yeah. or you just, you're not even out there. You just, it's carte blanche, do whatever you want. There's no one anywhere near you at the moment. I mean, the Bond got 10 coaches' votes again. Was he tagged? No, nope. they went to Trelaw. Went to, and that worked. Why can't you have two tags? What I did like about the Gold Coast, though, speaking of Damien Hardwick joining, I want to say almost the sole, 99% of the reason Sam Flanders stayed was because Dimmer came in. Yeah. He wasn't rated by Stewie Jew for whatever reason, yep. and he's having some sort of he's a season. Now, he, he? He's on fire. It's hard to believe that an opinion of a player can be yeah. so different from one coach to the next. The other one who didn't get tagged on the weekend was Isaac Rankin. Bizarre. That, but see, that was, that was the bizarre one for me. Sometimes I think um, the tag, they set it up, whilst it's suited for the player's attributes, yeah. like Will Phillips is more suited to Trelaw yeah. than it is to the Bond, yeah. but that's at the detriment of the team. Just and, a hint, though, Dacos well, is and, and now it's just amazing they've just discovered that. And, and Rankin's the other one. I doubt whether Isaac Rankin will ever have that much room again in his career, Hodgie, because that was one of the poorer defensive displays I've seen. Have you got a thought on the Giants and, and just what, what has gone wrong with them this year? Because five rounds in, we're thinking they are probably going to be there on grand final day. Well, <laughs> I went down there on, on Anzac night and, and watched them dismantle the Brisbane Lions. And this is when everyone thought, oh, Brisbane Lions are starting to get a little bit of momentum back. Yep. They made them look second rate. They were outstanding. Mm. Their transition, their runoff half back, 
Uh, you had Callahan leading the way. Callahan as a was body. enormous, wasn't he? He, he? he was exceptional. I, I sat back there, thought, "Hang on, this guy's a jet because of what he's able to do, his running ability." But they had everyone linking up. But but since then, it's their transition that that's cost them. Uh, what they've been able to do from zip to seven, they were in the top four for clearance to score. They were in the top four from turnover to score. Everything they did, they were able to work as a group to be able to transition the ball to to get it deep inside their forward fifty. But that's that's all stopped. Uh, their, their transition has got a hole in it. Where the teams are, where the teams are picked up on the fact that they like to handball the ball and link link up a little bit more. Where they'll try and squeeze, they'll try and squeeze in to shut them down. But that's the big noticeable thing for me. They get they get beaten in and around the contest more mm. than what they did early. But the biggest thing for for me for them is when they do have the ball in hand, it's it's not as smooth sailing. One bloke's leading one way, the ball get kicked the other. There's a lot more pressure on the ball, which they're turning it over as well. Luckily, um, found out the hard way that uh, you got to be consistent in this game. He was the hero against Geelong some weeks ago, and uh, he was made to look a little bit uh, foolish and just wasn't competitive enough against mainly Fogarty, but also in most contests that he went to, and, and the absence of Sam Taylor was, was glaring, I thought, in that game on Saturday night. Would you be frustrated if you're an Adelaide fan? Like, for them to be able to turn it on like that and wait until round 16. I mean, that's the Adelaide we probably thought we were getting for the majority Ooh. of this year. Well, okay, you probably watch Adelaide closer than what, what yeah. we do. Is is Rankin? Is he? Does he mean that much to him? Because oh, that's I, I sat back when he first got there, thinking he's he's going to be a quality half forward if he can push into the middle at times. But then he picked up a bit of a tank. The game that he did his ha- uh, hamstring against mm. Collingwood, he was the only one looking like he was going to save that game for him. And then he did his hamstring, walked off, and they, and they lost it when he overran it too far. He comes back in. It looked like they were just a different spark. It looks like he was the energizer, was able to kick goals, find the footy, do what. It, uh, like the connection he's got uh, with O'Brien, it, it just looked like they they take an extra step with him. Couple of things, yeah. I mean, had some I, injuries uh, too. That, uh, yeah, they had they had some, they had some injuries, Holes but I think most defense. most teams did. Like they lost to Richmond, and they had a whole swag of injuries as well. But no, no doubt he's there. He's now their most important player. I think that is obvious. He was shut down in the second half, just the six touches, but he was the one that absolutely got them going. He looks really competitive to me, and. There looks to be a real hatred for for losing, which I think has been missing in Adelaide. That they're, they're too nice. I think at times Jordan Dawson can be too nice. The coach certainly can. They've got to be more demanding and expect that level of performance from well, each other. Well, you're surprised he got ten coaches votes, given he had twenty one in the first no, half and six that in the was, second. Well, that's that game was, when over. It was done. Mm, yeah. yeah, I mean he had twenty one and five shots at yeah. goal. In the, he could have kicked five in the first half. Speaking of Even coaches though, votes, Whitfield Rory, had forty one. Yeah, Rory Lobb got Did, seven coaches four, votes. Seven. Seven. Mm. Yeah, that's well, a, that was. A, I, I knew something was going to give in that game, given it was the land of the Giants, and it wasn't going to be Norton going back, and it ended up being the Lobster. So where does his future lie? Because well, it's as a key back, right at the Dogs, at the Dogs, mm. and who knows where it might be elsewhere. You get it's a great move from the you're Dogs. Either trust, he stays as a key trust back, Rory Lobb as a key defender, ongoing, or, well, on the or do we look at it? Do we look at it and go good performance? Good, uh, accepted the challenge, but it was against North Melbourne, who yep. had Toby Pink and Bryn Tickle. So on the evidence, you're saying it's definitely worth persisting with yep, for next week. Five that. intercept marks, came off his man, used his athleticism. But are you trusting him well, it's worth in a, a final, an elimination final against Essendon right at now? The MCG to play back. Well, I'm 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 taking him there over Alex Keith. Okay, I'm, and I don't I'm think not, you move. Oh, I'm not ready to be. It's all the in failed on. forwards you move I'm back. You don't move 100%. your main offensive weapon yeah, back. Are you, you ready to trust? Next Rory week, Lobb, give it a try next so, week. So you got you got George Yardish and Marshall. Yep, similar. If he gets up next week, is is he going to stand up against those guys? Give him a because crack. I, I was I'll put my hand up and I, uh, Jared, I reckon you said last week, what would you do with uh, with the Lobb, big tall yep, timber at yep. Bulldogs? And I said I'd I'd have to drop him because the three guys. Yep. And I wasn't thinking about putting him back because I've I've never seen him defend mm-hmm. in his life. Same. Never actually seen him go into the defensive fifty, let alone start <laughs> down there. And look, I'll, I'll put my hand up, but Kane has a fair point. They're against a, a pretty young. Okay. Okay. I can only judge in, of what's been put in, in front of you. Me. Can that's why I put my hand up and say I was incorrect last week. But I'd love to see what he does over the in next two month weeks. If they time, stick with it. He's got the opportunity to go up against uh, Big Harry. They so play the ball. Great, they play great. the blues. Oh, that's a test. And that's, then he gets a chance. So he's got to earn, he's got to, all he's done now is earn the right to have yep. another crack at it this week, Fair which enough. he'll absolutely yep. get. And then we'll see if he earns the right again the week after. But I'm so not. he's got a two week preseason before round eighteen <laughs> yeah, when not. we're going to judge him. Kane, you might have to praise this one. It's going to hurt you, yeah, but it might in. work. Yep. No, I'm 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 optimistic that it can work, but okay. I'm just not ready to put his magnet there in permanent ink for a final. No, I'm not and, permanent and, and, final. See, it's round seventeen coming up. Let's just work with Rory Lobb, who continually. Teasers and then let you down. Maybe this is what he needs. Maybe he just needed to find his maybe position. He did, maybe he did. And hopefully for him, uh, he finds that. Uh, what about Sydney and their slow start, Todgy? Well, we had the discussion at the start with 
who's who's flag favourites? Is it Sydney? Is it Carlton? Um, and I can understand the the argument for both, but Sydney need to get a bit of a, a kick in the gear to start the game. Uh, what is it? Six of the last eight games have been down at quarter time. Like so, their their starts have been and they've been jumped by some good teams. But it's almost like they're waiting for mm. the second quarter to come round. They'll go and tag someone like they did against GWS. They put row bottom to green. They shut them down, but. They uh they better be careful if they give too many starts to too many teams. They let Carlton go. They're able to they were able to come back, but they've been behind. Yeah, six of the last seven games, and it's the first ten minutes where teams really jump them. It's almost like they're coming in waiting to see what happens in there, and then they react. And unfortunately, on the weekend, Frio got them by a long way, and were very convincing in that first quarter. But I, I'm still not. I'm still not sitting here going, I'm worried about Sydney just at this stage because you don't want to be playing your best football this stage. Mm. They, they, they're second. They're number one for second quarters. They're number one for third quarters. They're number two for fourth quarters. Uh, as it gets towards the end of the season, I'd want them to start sharpening up on that first quarter. But I, I think they're the big winners out of the loss. It's a good loss. Because they get the challenge. I mean, all of a yeah. sudden, Heaney is going to have to work out, okay, how am I going to approach this differently next time? Chad Warner, he's now been down two weeks in a row. What's Chad going to do? Because he's going to get pinged. I mean... They are going to lock down on these guys. He may have to go forward. And so I think John Longmire is going to have to start saying, well, Mm. okay, do we wait and see if he can fight back or do we just bang him in on the forward pocket? And uh, Papley goes in. Mm. There's all these challenges that if they hadn't been asked in round 16, they could have been asked in the first week of finals. Is it Wharfie time, though? Put your Superman capes on? That was a heck of a win from the Dockers. No, it's great. I mean, I've been uh, on the Dockers bandwagon for a fair period of time. That was a heck of a been a lot of criticism on the uh, temper text that has for that positivity. <laughs> I'm just trying to steer you back into order. But there's no question, they they have got as much talent as just about anybody going around. Sean Darcy, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, if, if you look at that, though, the, the, the spread of possessions for him as well. It wasn't yeah. just the same. It wasn't Saron getting 38. It wasn't Brayshaw. I think Luke, Luke Ryan had 26. he had the most touches yeah. with 26 with Sharp and Brayshaw 25. Saron yeah. had 23. From to come out and beat the team that has looked so convincing all year, especially with Pierce broken yeah. arm, Luke Ryan Cox. stepped up in that in that area. And we, we mentioned that Luke Ryan, they, they rate him as a leader there, even though he's not in the leadership group. He's as vocal as anyone out in that football field. So for him to fill the void with Pierce going out and then spread the love throughout the midfield, it was a great win by him. All right, Hodgie, you've got a minute to talk about our Hawks. <laughs> our Hawks? It's yeah. your Hawks, Kane. Well, I, I, I was going to try and Hawks. see what, what, uh, what information from your best friend uh, have you been telling him because he's, they've been on fire. What Hawthorne have been able to do? Um, seven of the last eight games. Uh, they're rated highly in all main categories uh, and it's just been a change. And this is, goes back to what we sort of spoke about with, with Ross and the, and the style. Hawthorne, you're probably almost looking and you put them with the Geelong, the Sydney, mm. the Collingwood, these teams that want to take the game on. If that means they're going to turn over and let a goal go out the back, Mitch is okay with that as long as you're happy to take the game on and learn from your mistakes. So I still think they're scratching. They've, they haven't climbed the ladder considering they've only lost one game in the last eight. I think they've only gone up two spots. But I think the signs are there. Are they going to do anything in finals? I'm not convinced yet, but they're, they're well on the way for Jump a bright on. three or you four years. You can join myself and Luke Hodges, Hawthorne members today, back <laughs> after this. Hodgie, the Geelong game was fascinating and uh, for many reasons, but Tom Stewart starting in at the centre bounce and then just rolling back. What did you make of Tom's latest positional tweak? Uh, I liked it, to be honest. We, we spoke last week on what things could Scotty do to, to help him out because... Scotty would be looking down at Tom Short go, he's a five-time uh, All-Australian sitting across the half-back line. He's mature enough. You let, let him handle the tag out himself. Sometimes on the half-back line, you, you need a bit of help because it is. All, all the negating forward needs to do is keep you to 15 touches while they have 10 and it's classified as a win. Yep. Um, so to put him into the middle meant that it, it was going to have to change some things up for Essendon if they were going to run with him. He went into 24 centre bounce attendances. I reckon he wouldn't have done that in his whole career, mm. which is a good sign. But then he was able to help in all different areas of the game. He had the third most touches for Geelong. He had six score involvement, still took four intercept marks. Man, he still was be able to position himself behind the ball, had the five tackles, four clearances. So what I, what I did like was the fact that the coaches tried to help him out, put him in a different position, make the opposition think their way around. If you're going to tag it, is that going to upset their structure? Uh, and he was able to have a, a really good impact uh, onto a really good win for Geelong, considering leading into that game. They'd only had one win from seven games. Yeah, it was a great turnaround. It was probably uh, as big an upset as there was in the uh, in the whole round. Are you fearful for Essendon, or are you like me that uh, you're entitled to have a, a bad half? Um, I, I was I was confident with Essendon, uh, mm-hmm. but what 
looking back into who they've who they've beaten, jo- Essendon and North Melbourne are the only two teams that haven't beaten a team in the current top eight. So you sort of sit back and look at that, and I'm thinking that Essendon beat GWS, but they're now out of the eight, and yes, they beat them when they're in good form. But you sit back, and I, I spoke to a lot of Essendon supporters that, that are friends with, and they're um they're a little bit nervous the fact that when the mm. pressure was on for, for them and for them to beat Geelong on a on the MCG big game, yes, the the, the conditions weren't great, but they needed for a little bit of confidence for himself going into the back end of the season. They needed to beat Geelong, just knowing that it's a big team, it's a big game, we can handle the situation, handle the conditions, and they couldn't. So they're sort of sitting here second guessing himself. And I know this it was this time last year that Brad's God put it on to the media saying that we're fatigued, we're not fit enough, we're not match fit. Yep. Can one extra preseason them not going to? on a footy trip instead, them going to America and training as, as a group that they did in the off-season, can that improve the fitness in, in one year? Time, time will tell, but this is the time where they really fatigued and the fact that they haven't beaten another top eight team at this stage, it, it's a little bit concerning for me and I know it is for a few of the Essendon supporters. I'm mm. going to go home and uh, have a look at that game, but just looking at the numbers, Coldwell and Martin, they had uh, 32 and 27. Merritt, I know, got shadow, but he still had 23. So what was it about then? Durham had 18, so that's a bit off the pace. What was it about them that uh, you felt really lacked? Uh, with Martin. Martin, I liked him across halfback because he could really set it up. Him yeah. going into the midfield, he gets it, but it, it, his possessions aren't as clean as what they were. Uh, I think he was he was fourth rated for best kick or best possession getter for Essendon in the first half of the year. Since he's gone into the midfield the last few weeks, he's really dropped away at that. Mm. Um, they just... they. They, they've been able to get the ball inside Ford 50, but the Ford structure is a concern for me. You look at Geelong, they, their, Ford, their Ford structure actually worked on the weekend. If you look at what Langford's been able to do, you look what Wright, Draper, Jones. Package. The package. Package has been pretty lively the last couple of weeks, but Langford, from rounds 12 to 16, has kicked three goals. Like their last three losses, they've had more inside 50s yep. than the opposition, but haven't won, haven't put it on the scoreboard. You sort of look back at what Brisbane were doing early in the year. They were dominating in so many areas, but the main part, the main part that you need to get the game right is the connection going inside Ford 50 yep. and kicking the goals. And that, that's an area over the last month that they've really dropped away. They've been able to get more inside 50s, but they haven't been able to convert through Langford, through Wright and the likes. So the coaches' votes, Ollie Dempsey 9, Joe Coldwell 5, Zach Tui 5, Max Holmes 5, Mitch Duncan 5, Tom Stewart 5, Nick Martin 1. Hmm. I just I, I, I don't see the package. I don't see Peter Wright. I mean, clearly mm. uh, their forward line didn't function. Yeah, well, and that, that's the thing is when you go through and get done by forty points, and I know a lot of the, a lot of the uproar was about the the rush behind, and a lot of the uproar yep. was about the umpiring. But since that situation there, the cats dominated. And and I, what I did like for for the cats, and I, I know we're sort of talking, it was a, it was a good battle, which everyone was looking for, but. With Hawk going out, they were able to, and Ollie Henry being out, yeah. they were able to change up their their forward their yeah. forward dimension. So I know Cameron was being able to he's been able to play a little bit more forward, but they had Gary Rowan. So Gary Rowan was the most targeted forward going inside Ford fifty on the yep. weekend. Where in the prior, Ollie Henry has been the bloke and yep. then Cameron and Hawk. So being a smaller, more agile forward line, especially with those conditions. It worked a lot better for, for the Cats on, on uh, Saturday. I was really uh, happy to see Tyson Stengel sign the five-year deal. I thought it was a smart yep. decision. Yeah, well, that, that was that was the one that everyone was sort of waiting on. And, and I know that the there's always that temptation for, for a bloke who lost his contract when he was over in Adelaide and, and finally got a, a second go at it. Um, but there would have been some big numbers getting thrown towards mm. him. So the fact that he actually summed up, realised that Geelong were able to – they gave him that second opportunity for him to sort of sit back and say, this is where I want to finish off my career. It's a great side for the Cats, and, and more importantly, it's it's good that he feels stable down there and, and wants to sign and keep playing for the Cats. Oh, Jill, I wanted to ask you, when things start to conspire against you when you're out there and, and conspire against you in a hurry like they did in the third quarter for us, and it was interesting listening to Kyle Langford. I'm not sure if you heard this on the Sunday footy show, basically suggesting that there, it was the resilience piece that maybe a few of the players felt like the world was against them. They went into their shell a little bit. They couldn't deal with the fact that it was all going against them. And I guess the mental battle in a situation like that, is that that's something that you can that resonates with you in any way? Yeah, and the, the only way that you can build resilience from that is continue to go through it. And, and this is what the, this is the concerning thing and why, why I had a little bit of doubt on Essendon and why their supporters did is because what – what big games have they played in over the last few years that actually meant something? As far as if we win this, we can be in the top four again. Like they're back into the, the hurdle now. But 
the, the, the more that they play in those big games, the more they play against the big clubs, the more that something goes wrong. And if you don't turn the tide in the third quarter, that the game's finished and that could cost you a top four position. Resilience will build from that. So the more that they open up and understand that that was one that got away. Next time they're in that, what can they do differently to make sure this doesn't happen again? So I actually like the honesty that sometimes that things don't go your, your way and, and you do crack it. You do crack the, yeah. crack the sads and, and turn the toes up, but you – to play in big finals, to win big finals and to win grand finals, you need to be able to push past that resilient side of thing and, and keep focused on what you have to do. And for whatever reason, Peter Wright, I mean, the numbers are okay at the weekend, but just not the same player that we know he can be. And I think he's got to pick one Ruckman, Brad Scott. Just pick one, whether it be Draper or God. Like Carlton, their win-loss looks a lot better. That's fact when they play one Ruckman. And I know the conditions... Didn't, I'm a uh, huge fan of Draper, I've got to say. I think he's a spiritual uh, leader. Well, he's... I don't think Draper can play forward, so just play him in the ruck. Play him in the ruck. And, and, and Goldie and will just have to have a spell. Yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Hodgie. What's, uh, I was just trying to think, who got subbed? I had a, a note here. Uh, Jones. I was, I was sitting yep. in there. Jones, he played one of the better second quarters that I've seen. Harrison Jones floating further up the ground, the Red Cross half back. How come he got subbed? Is there any inkling into that? Was was there injuries? I, I understand that the conditions weren't great for Tools, and they yeah. did, as you said, Sammy. They went in there with a couple of ruckmen. They got right up there. Jones is is probably the most inexperienced Tall that they do have. But I thought he had a really good first half. And all of a sudden, when they need to make a move, he's the one who gets plonked onto the bench. And it's an easy easy thing to suggest. I, I just the Geelong forward line, whether it was coincidental or whether it was because Tom Hawkins wasn't there, they just looked like they had real zest back in and amongst them. Some speed, some unpredictability. Life of that, Tom Hawkins step up Shannon Neal, and then we saw what Gary Rowan can do. Now, that's been one of the great curiosities, if not frustrations for a player like Gary. He can have games like that, yep. go missing for a few weeks, and then bob up and do it again. Well, they're certainly going to be uh, more flexible and more defensively minded because the speed factor. I mean, Tom <laughs> has lost his speed, and he's, uh, he's probably going to struggle to get back in, I would have thought. Also, but, if, but if they're right in the finals mix, and there's a lot of crystal balling with this, yeah. It'd take a pretty brave coach with all the history as well between mm. the two of them, Chris and Tom, for Chris to leave him out, surely. That, that's also up to, to Tom, though. If Tom can sort of sit back and see that they're playing a different style, uh, a more energetic style with a, a younger, smaller forward line, then it's also up to him not putting the pressure on, on Chris if that's what, what he sees as, as a leader. Because the big, the hardest thing in football is a leader putting – a leader will always tell players you've got to put your team before yourself. And when it comes to yourself making that call, that's, that's big. And I think – Hawk has a team first mentality, but it was right. Weather was the conditions, but they looked mm. so much more lively than the Essendon forwards because of the agility of that forward line. Yeah, and Ollie Henry to come back into it as well. Joe, Cameron, as well, I think, it? played a lot better uh, when he was closer more to target. goal. Yeah. And and speaking of rucks, they still went in with Blitzarves and Deconing again yeah. in, in in the ruck. And I know Toby Conway's well, uh, injured at the moment. Well, they haven't got many options really, have they? Unless they go back to Stanley. Yeah. Well, his papers appear to be. Got the stamp, never to play again. Yeah. LJ Witten. Stanley's been stamped. Hey, uh, Hodgie, on your run sheet here, you've got uh, Collingwood, but not so much Collingwood, but their midfield and uh, the sort of numbers that the opposition midfield might be accumulating. Yeah, I was, I was looking before when Dimmer said, geez, you probably should tag Dacos, because <laughs> uh, I'm not going to lie, both of them are pretty handy. What uh, what Josh did uh, at times on uh, on the weekend, just we all know what, what Nick does, but um, I sort of, I've been looking at the opposition to to Collingwood's midfield and maybe they should start to have a little bit of maybe Crisp might go on but do a bit of a shutdown role because their last couple of losses on the weekend Anderson had 39 Flanders had 33 then you look at the game they had against Bulldogs Bont had 38 Trelaw had 37 Dale had 35 and if you're winning which Collingwood have done for the last 18 months um, obviously grand final last year but they're sort of in and around that mix that if you drop a couple games maybe as much as Dimmer said he might start respecting other teams should respect Dacos a little bit more. Maybe Collingwood mids mm. should start to shut a couple down because what we've found out, and we've spoken time and time again, midfielders are too damaging these days. They don't just get it and just flick off one or two handballs. It's get it. They break the lines. They can kick goals. Maybe they should start to keep an eye on the opposition mids just so they're not getting so much of the football given their forwards opportunity. Well, they shared it around. Now Anderson got eight votes. Nick Dacos got eight. Sam Flanders, who you talked about, uh, he got eight as well. But... Uh, Bodie Euland, he got two. He's uh, he's actually really flying up the ladder. Jared Witch, two. One to Ben Ainsworth and one to Jordan Goey. Um, if if two blokes get at 30 each, Hodgie, <laughs> and a tagger gets at 15 and the midfielder gets at 20, who wins? 
The two blokes have got 30 each, which neutralises, or the midfielder gets tagged and gets a net plus five. Well, it, it, it changes per person because if you've got two blokes going head-to-head, one gets 25 kicks and five handballs and mm. the other one gets 25 handballs and five kicks, I'm going to go with the bloke who's getting 25 okay. kicks because he's going to be taking ground, setting up play. Uh, so it, it's... The, 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 it's with the AFL, quality of the possession, I know the numbers yeah, is probably so, too simplistic. Yeah, it's it's the damage. It's how much damage that person yeah. does. So that that's where it's hard because we, we've got so many shapes and sizes that play through our midfield. Everyone has got different strengths. Okay, who had a more damaging twenty-five? Nara Anderson or Nick Dacos? Because oh, the coaches Dacos said they both true. had them both. They, well, that's what I mean. If you're going head for head, I'd be shutting down Dacos. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be I'll be putting Tuke over to him and shutting down. But you look at Collingwood this weekend. We just spoke about how um, the mids of of GWS and, and Bulldogs, they're coming up against Essendon. And yep. Essendon's midfield can find the footy as good as Merritt. Mm. When, when he finds the footy, he can get it mid-30s himself. And we spoke about Martin, what he's been able to do and find the footy. So this could be a bit of a question. If Essendon do get a bit of a sniff, will Collingwood go and shut down the Who'll win that mids? game, Hodgie? Uh well, that's that's a toss of the coin. This yep. this is another big test for this is a this is another big one. I said last week that Geelong and Essendon they had big tests on each. Collingwood are injury prone. They've got a lot of injuries. They've still got a lot of blokes to come back. But this is another massive test for Essendon. Friday night there's going to be ninety thousand people Monster. there. They need to prove a point against the grand finals from last year, the premiership Oof. team from last year, and stand up under these pressure situations. Sammy, you said before that. Bit of resilience. Some things might go, might not go their way, mm. and Collingwood will get a run on at some stage in that second or third quarter or yep. fourth quarter. Can Essendon withstand it and, and show that resilience that they lacked on on the third quarter on Friday? Text on, just on coming weekend. through in 2011. Chris Scott had to make a call yeah. between young Tom Hawkins and an experienced Cam Mooney, and uh, he chose the Hawk. He was panned at the time. Even Moons though said it was the right decision in hindsight. Scotty may have the same conundrum with uh, Hawk on the other end of it. Yeah, there's, there's, only one, there, there's only one thing with that. When Scotty came in, he had no relationship with Can Moon. Yeah, that's right. Since he's come in, he's built premierships. He's built yep. success. He's built years and years of trust, mateship, hard, tough conversations about personal life, about football. Totally, <laughs> totally different when you've got to make a decision against the bloke who you're coaching for the first year. That's a very, very good point. Uh, and as well, just coming back to Collingwood Neston, the Pies gave up 68 inside 50. So mm. just coming back on, uh, I guess, the defensive side of their game, 68 entries Gold Coast if, racked up at the weekend. And that's the thing is, Essendon, as we've said, the last their last three losses, that they've been able to get more inside 50s in the opposition. Mm. So it's about Essendon converting and then Collingwood being able to shut down the mids. Number of texts uh, wanting your thoughts on Darcy Moore. Has he got a problem with the way he attacks the ball? With the knees and um, the backs? Oh, that that was that was concerning because um, who did you get on the weekend? Apologies. Um, Wits. Joe Wits. Wits yeah, yeah, that was always – I felt as far as the Wits, can, uh, the Wits knock, I thought that was in the similar areas as Petrarca as far as the amount of pain that yep. was on his face and he was grimacing there. The only thing is that's – our game is allowing it. So does Darcy Moore have an issue with it? No, because our rule says that if you're flying for the ball, you can put your yep. knee up to protect it. If this keeps happening, as the AFL have put rules in to stop players from getting hurt, they may change it. But this has been a part of our game – for, for a long period of Didn't time. Didn't look and deliberate in any way, shape, it, or form, it, which is... In, in all, of, four, in four, all four, those four, ones, right. in the Petrarca one in, and also the Wits one, yep. Darcy Moore was 100% going for the ball, 100%. but you use your momentum to go up with your knee to protect yourself, but also if someone's here, you get a right up off the other person. But both times... He's, he's been able to get him, but there's been no malice with Darcy Moore out of both of those. Um, Hodgie is with us, of course. Hodgie, uh, back on Friday night. Uh, pretty entertaining game it was in the end. Melbourne and Brisbane, uh, not without its own sense of controversy to some degree, uh, but Hugh McCluggage slotting that kick from the bandrel on after Alex Neil Bull. And uh, we'll dive over, state of origin style. Um, <laughs> how did you how did you see how did you see this one playing out? And uh, Brisbane didn't have it all their own way, but uh, kept the ball rolling. No, I thought, to be honest, that second quarter, I thought Melbourne were back. I thought Viney was back to his best. I thought Oliver, uh, he's, had a, he's had a tough six weeks, but he looked exceptional. Mm. Uh, he was able to run around. They started him on the forward line just to see if they were going to have a tag. Barry went to Viney, which could not stop him. Uh, and you sort of sit back and look at the second quarter, and they kicked eight goals too, and the Brisbane Lions could not do a thing. They beat him in inside 50s, contested clearances. They were all over him, and... Brisbane Lions did not have a yelp, could not do anything with the, the force that Melbourne were playing. And because of Pickett, they were so efficient. Their biggest thing for, for Melbourne going forward was the inability to score. And Pickett was able to save that in the first two and a half, three quarters. But unfortunately for for Melbourne, uh, the last quarter came and, and the Lions had their turn to run and, and they dominated that last quarter. 
Hodgie, what would have been going through the coach's mind, knowing what he did in the semi-final against Melbourne to change the tagging operation with um, Berry going to Viney and not going to Oliver? I think because of Viney was playing the Petrarca role, so they thought Petrarca had been in good form and they thought Oliver had, hadn't been in, in great form for the last six weeks, so they thought maybe our mids might be able to take him on, hunt him head on, head on head, but to be honest, it, it didn't quite work and they ended up just dropping the tag, letting mm. Barry go back and play his wing and then from that, it was just sort of go head to head and, and the Lions were able to get back their way, but I reckon if they had their time again, Viney was damaging and when Viney's in the form that he's in with that mindset and how hard he's going, not many taggers can stop him, so I reckon Oliver will be the one in the sights if they come up again. Yeah, I kept watching in the last quarter and Oliver probably should have uh, won the game for them. I thought it was a bit of a blue. What, I wanted to ask both of you guys, this is quite rare, but for Chris Fagan to admit the name and shame approach at the, at the major break with his midfielders, what do you think of that, Hodgie? Put him up on the board. No, but that's that's honesty. Everyone sits back and says Chris Fagan won't have a go at his, ta- mm. at his players. In the game, when it's time to do it, he'll sit back and look at you and then tell you if you're doing it, if you're hard enough or not. So that, it wouldn't be a surprise to the players. Hodgie, superb as always. Great to have you on. Hodgie. Hope you have a fantastic week, mate. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.